I'd like to thank the Office of Student Life uh, for sponsoring this event along with the philosophy department and thanks to everybody for coming out on a snowy day that's going to be gorgeous tomorrow. So, fast retreat here in Colorado. So, a brief couple words of introduction for um, Professor Talese. Uh, and then uh, he'll give his talk. And then afterwards, there'll be plenty of time for questions. There are a couple of microphones up here. Uh, don't be shy. If you have questions after the talk, please come up and, and ask your questions. We've left plenty of time for, uh, for conversation. And that's really what um, we're, we're interested in. So Professor Talese is um, the uh, philosophy chair at the Vanderbilt uh, Philosophy Department. He's also the W. Alton Jones uh, professor there. His current research focuses on democracy, polarization, public ignorance, and egalitarianism. Uh, Dr. Talese is the author of numerous articles and more than 10 books, many of them dealing with how we think and organize ourselves in matters of ethics and politics. Some of his recent works can give us a little bit of a clue into some of his interests. Um, some recent books are include Engaging Political Philosophy, Why We Argue and How We Should, Pluralism and Liberal Politics, Democracy and Moral Conflict, and Democracy After Liberalism. Some of his uh, recent articles include uh, The Trouble with Hooligans. So, is there any hooligans here? No one? We'll, we'll find out. Oh, I'm well, just one. Uh, New Trouble for Deliberative Democracy, Sustaining Democracy, and uh, Does Public Ignorance Defeat Deliberative Democracy? So this is something I think we've all wondered about. Uh, Rob is all, an especially engaged kind of scholar, though, so I think you're going to find his talk very engaging because he's, he's very used to, unlike a lot of academics, he's very used to connecting at different registers and with different audiences. Uh, he has a TED talk called Putting Politics in Its Place. He does monthly contributions to a very uh, <coughs> eclectic uh, pop, um, web blog called Three Quarks Daily. He co-hosts the podcast New Books in Philosophy along with two other suspects, um, Carrie Figdor and our own Sarah Tyson. Um, <laughs> He has a podcast devoted to argumentation called Why We Argue, and he has a video podcast called Philosophy 15 with 15-minute unscripted discussions of philosophical topics. And both of those, the podcast and the video um, podcast, or whatever you call it, vidcast, uh, are with uh, Professor Scott Aiken down at Vanderbilt. So today's talk is entitled Overdoing Democracy, Why We Must Put Politics in Its Place, would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Talese. Thank you. Thanks a lot for coming out. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to try to speak up because I, I, I like to walk a little bit um, when I talk, and um, I take it that uh, the microphone is not strictly necessary. All right, so I'm going to move quickly, but that's not because I want to be evasive, but rather because I want to make sure that um, we've got uh, time to take questions. Um, so there are some elements of what I want to say today that um, invoke um, a range of empirical considerations that I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A, but I might run very quickly uh, through uh, some of the empirical stuff um, or some of the empirical side of the argument, um, uh, but I'm ready uh, to take questions about, uh, about some of that stuff. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I have this book that's just come out um, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, called Overdoing Democracy, Why We Must Put Politics in Its Place. Um, and one of the central theses of that book is what's uh, represented there on the left side of the slide. Um, the cure for democracy's ills is not more democracy, but less. Now, I think I know or can anticipate what some of you are thinking. Um, that is, uh, both the title, the subtitle, uh, and uh, that depiction of the main thesis uh, might suggest to you that the overall message of the book is um, some version of uh, anti-democracy, skepticism about democracy, um, some call for uh, rule by elites, um, or um, uh, maybe rule by authoritarians. Um, and I want to suggest to you in this talk that um, uh, that's not the case, uh, that um, it's fully consistent with a uh, robust 
uh, conception uh, of democracy and democratic citizenship. Um, it's fully consistent with full-throated support of such a conception of democracy and democratic citizenship to hold that, nonetheless, um, it's possible to overdo democracy. Um, that is, um, it's possible to hold that democracy is a super-duper important good that we have to be really invested in, and yet, nonetheless, hold that um, uh, it needs to be kept in its place. Okay, so... Um, the talk's title is um, The Problem of Polarization. And um, I want to suggest to you, at least just as a, a prompt to start thinking about how the argument is going to track, that um, uh, there are a series of um, phenomena that are called polarization. I want to disambiguate two of them and try to suggest to you that once you understand uh, these two different phenomena that are both called polarization, they're distinguished on the handout if you uh, have it, um, uh, once you see how those two interact, you'll understand, uh, or you'll at least see the case I'm trying to make for the idea that it's possible to overdo democracy. So here's the plan. Um, we're going to start by disambiguating these two different senses of polarization, two different things that can be called polarization. They're quite different. Um, one of them is political polarization, which you're probably familiar with. The other is this perhaps less familiar phenomenon called belief polarization. Um, uh, because it's less familiar, and I also think philosophically more interesting, um, we're going to then talk about how belief polarization works. This is a cognitive phenomenon that has to do with uh, how we come to form and revise and hold our beliefs. Um, once we see what belief polarization is and how it works, uh, I want to talk then about the impact of belief polarization. Um, most um, academic discussions of the phenomenon tend to focus on one dimension of um, its impact, I think that far more interesting is a, uh, a different dimension, um, uh, namely how belief polarization impacts our view of other people. Um, once we talk a little bit about um, how belief polarization uh, impacts our view of other people, um, I'm going to introduce an additional uh, phenomenon that I call political saturation. Uh, the thought is going to be that um, uh, political saturation be defined in a moment, um, is what makes belief polarization problematic, or especially um, democratically degenerative. Um, and once we see that belief polarization under conditions of political saturation is democratically degenerative, we'll have our account of how democracy can be overdone. Uh, finally, we'll talk a little bit about prescriptive measures, what can be done. I'm going to move very quickly through that prescriptive part, not because I want to be evasive, but because in giving uh, talks on this topic now for over a year, uh, I've discovered that um, for reasons that are predictable given the diagnostic side of what I'm going to say, uh, if you go too quickly into the prescriptive mode, it all backfires. And the, 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 the pathology <laughs> just reasserts itself. Uh, if you want to ask me about how I've come to that conclusion, uh, 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 I'm happy to tell some stories about uh, some of the pushback I've gotten. Okay, so um, let's begin then with two kinds of polarization. Um, one kind is already familiar to you. Uh, it's what's I'm sorry. It's what's depicted in the graphic there, um, and it's called political polarization. And it's uh, polarization of the kind that's often what is being lamented in popular commentary about contemporary democracy. It is as it's depicted in the graphic there. Um, political polarization is both the phenomenon of and the metric of some kind of divide between opposed political groups or factions or parties. Um, as it turns out, uh, and is often not fully discussed in the vernacular of political commentary, there are different ways of understanding what that gap consists in and therefore how it's to be measured. And therefore, there's no simple answer to the question of how polarized American democracy is right now. So I just want to disambiguate sort of three different ways of thinking about what's missing in that bridge. Um, one way of thinking about the sort of ideological divide between uh, these, uh, between uh, the two parties, let's say, is to think of it in terms of a metric of the division among the parties' platforms. That is. Uh, the platform interpretation of political polarization says 
were especially polarized when the official platforms of the competing parties have no political objectives in common and in fact have opposed or inconsistent political objectives. That's only one metric, by the way, of uh, thinking about the ideological divide that might be present in a democratic society. We can think of another, uh, what's called partisan polarization. Partisan polarization tries to conceptualize the political division uh, at work in a democracy by looking at the extent to which the parties and the officials, the, main, the party leaders and their candidates are ideologically homogeneous. That is one way of thinking about the separation between the parties is to look to see how rare is the conservative Republican, is the conservative Democrat, or how rare is the leftward leaning or the liberal leaning Republican to the extent that each of the parties is internally composed of like-minded people who don't waver that's another metric of the political division between them. And by the way, if you're familiar with the words, the acronyms rhino and dino, that's an expression of that conception of polarization. These are Republican in name only, Democrat in name only. Now there's a third way of understanding political polarization that I think is um, more important. Um, precisely because this um, kind of political polarization is not new, none of them are new, but this metric of political polarization is actually more intense now with respect to ordinary citizens than it has been in the past 20, uh, 15 to 20 years. Uh, affective polarization is a metric of the ideological divide that does not look primarily at the parties and their documents and their leadership and their candidates but rather looks at the negative attitudes, rank and file affiliates, citizens who affiliate, maybe aren't members, but affiliate with a party, the negative attitudes they have towards the rank and file citizens who affiliate with the opposite party. That is a metric that tries to understand polarization, not by looking at the party documents and the party leadership, but instead by looking at citizens who affiliate with a party and trying to figure out how icky do they find the other, the other, the, their fellow citizens who affiliate differently. Note that in any of these ways of understanding the phenomena, just as the graphic depicts, it, the metric of political polarization is um, a two-place sort of relation. It's about the distance between two distinct and opposed parties. I want to contrast that with this other phenomenon that I'm going to call belief polarization. Belief polarization is just a different kind of phenomenon, both in the sense that it's cognitive. It has to do with, as I said earlier, how we form and revise and maintain and hold our beliefs. But it's also not a metric of the distance between two opposed groups. It's rather a metric of a shift that occurs within a group. Um, so belief polarization roughly is the phenomenon, uh, it's uncommonly robust as I'll say, uh, explain in a moment, it's the phenomenon by which interactions among like-minded people transforms each party to the interaction into a more extreme version of their prior self. When we interact, that is, only with like-minded others, or mainly with like-minded others, we become more extreme versions of ourselves. Now, I'm going to leave to the side some philosophical nuance about what we mean by extreme here, um, which we can get into. It turns out, just for the philosophers in the room, you come to hold more extreme contents and you come to a higher level of confidence. Uh, if that is confusing to you, philosophers make a distinction between the content of belief and the degree of belief. The degree of belief is your confidence. The content of belief is the thing that you believe. In belief polarization, you come to hold a more extreme version of the content, and you become more confident in your belief. OK. Um, now, what's interesting about this phenomenon is that it is uncommonly robust. It's been studied fairly uh, extensively for over 60 years. 
It's founding groups of all kinds, not just political groups, not just groups that are, not only groups that are united around some moral or evaluative claim. It doesn't track or vary with any of the demographics uh, or other kinds of sociological markers that you might think it would vary with. So it's found across, and found not to vary much across, economic, racial, reli gender, religious affiliation, geography, cultural background. Um, so it seems like it's uh, far more tied to modes of our cognition than uh, to, strictly speaking, uh, our sociology. Um, it is found and can be induced um, uh, um, in groups of different kinds. That is, you find group members, you know, like-minded group members, shifting to more extreme versions of themselves when the group is getting together to decide on a collective action, when the group is getting together not to decide on a collective action, but just, try, just to try to reach some kind of agreement about what they should believe. You also find the um, phenomenon in groups where they don't have any particular purpose in mind. They're just talking about what they agree about. Um, it's found um, in cases where um, the belief with respect to which the group is like-minded has some evaluative dimension, like the attractiveness of a face, the punitive award that is due to somebody who has suffered uh, some kind of um, uh, crime or infraction. Um, it um, exists and can be found and can be induced in groups that um, are merely talking about the elevation of a city. Here's a joke about Denver. You get a bunch of people together who agree that Denver is especially high in elevation. You ask them before they start talking to you together, how high is Denver? And they give some estimate. And you say, are you sure Denver's not that much more high? And they say, no, it's definitely not that high. And then you get them talking. And they all shift, not only to believe that Denver is higher than what they said it was, but their estimation of the Denver's ele elevation tends to exceed what prior they said was the cap. Can't be higher than, you know, 1,800 miles. <laughs> or can't be higher than that. That's an extreme version. Uh, but um, so you find it with non-evaluative, purely factual matter. <laughs> so it looks, again, from a philosophical point of view, it's interesting because it looks kind of terrifying. We're far less in control of our minds than it seems like we should be. Um, and by the way, it, it always moves in the direction of the more extreme version of what you were, more, what you were inclined to think before the conversation started. Um, and note, very importantly, um, the phenomenon affects groups composed of moderates no less, no differently, than it affects groups who have some members who are extremists. So it is not a matter of the extremist pulling the moderates his way. Right? In fact, those who, are, those who begin an interaction with an extreme view shift, into, as individuals, shift more rapidly and more drastically than the mean, the person holding the mean view, the person in the middle, right? So it doesn't look like it's um, obviously just a case of uh, the more extreme guy browbeating everybody else, because even if there are no browbeaters in the group, the group nonetheless, the mean judgment, shifts in roughly the same way and into the same respect. Now, it's puzzling for all kinds of reasons, and you might start wondering, well, wow, it looks uncommonly robust. It's widely uh, studied. It affects people in all of these different kinds of contexts. What could possibly be happening? Well, um, a lot of the research on belief polarization tends to focus on um, contexts where you have like-minded people discussing the matter with respect to which they are like-minded. That has led researchers to describe the phenomenon as the product of like-minded discussion. Here's some bad news. The participants don't need to have any discussion. They don't even need to have any interaction. As I put it uh, in the book, Mere corroboration, I'll explain that in a second, suffices. That is to say, 
Although like-minded discussion is a reliable site and venue to produce and study the effect, the effect itself does not require like-minded discussion. What all you need in order to get the extremity shifts of the belief polarization phenomenon is what's going on in the picture there. A bunch of people whose shared identity is made salient to them and a presentation to each member that the other people believe the kind of thing that they think. They don't need to share information. They don't need to give each other any reasons. They don't need to share their evidence for the reason why they believe the thing that everybody else believes. They just have to affirm each other in a particular way. Now, if you are a sports fan, you've, this has happened to you. You've gone to see your favorite team play an important home game. You probably did something to make sure that everybody else attending that knew whose side you were on. To signal to others what your affiliation is with respect to the competing teams. You probably did things to put yourself in conformity with the behavior of the other people who were signaling their affiliation with that team. You probably dressed like them. You stood up when they did. You said the words that they said. You engaged in behavior that in the collective constituted a grand signaling of the common identity of the group. And while you were doing those things, what happened to you? You felt, wow, my team is really great. They're even better than I thought. The poor slobs rooting for the other team. What's wrong with them? I feel bad for them. They're idiots. They should be on our side. Our team's going to win because we're better. That quarterback is better than I thought he was. That all of your attitudes, dispositions, and beliefs about the team became intensified, magnified, extremified, simply in virtue of being in the presence of a group of people who share that identity and are signaling it to you. By the way, this is why sports teams, when they're winning, pack stadiums. It feels good to be affirmed in those ways. We like that feeling, right? If sports are not your thing, think about the last concert you went to with your favorite group, your favorite band. Same thing happened. That's why musical acts that are getting a lot of play on the radio that have a big fan base can charge crazy amounts of money for tickets not because you like to hear the band that much but because in hearing the band live you get a rush feels good um, so not only do you feel good about your commitments you feel good about being a fan of the team you come to hold more extreme versions of your beliefs about the merits and virtue of the team you also become more willing to engage in behavior expressive of your support of the team that prior to arriving in the stadium you would have thought would have been silly. That is, you, in certain kinds of contexts, this has been studied and called risky shift. Um, if you want an ultimate discussion of hooliganism, you want ultimate, how does hooliganism happen? Um, when people feel their identity affirmed in certain ways or maybe attacked in certain ways, they become more willing to engage in behavior that prior to the group activity, which instigated those feelings, they would have said would be too risky to engage in. Okay. Um, the upshot of that idea or that conception of the mechanism of belief polarization is this. Our physical and social environments can induce the phenomenon. You don't need to be talking to people. You don't need to be listening to their reasons. All you need is a corroborating feedback. People like me think the things that I think. If you ever are wondering, what's the ultimate explanation of social, of memes online? <coughs> of why do people cover their lawns around election day with the same campaign sign? Why does it matter to politicians how big the crowds are? Or why is it so important to see a sea of campaign signs or red hats? It's 
because the people managing the campaigns know this, and the way to extract behavior from you <laughs> is to get this phenomenon going. It has nothing to do with reasons or arguments or sentences. Simply to do with the people like you agree with you about this thing. It's all you need. I have a joke here. There's no I in team, but there is a me. Now this all looks pretty bleak, especially from an epistemic perspective. We're less in control of our minds than we thought, but it gets worse. Now, belief polarization is often discussed in this literature, strictly among the philosophers and among some of the social scientists too, strictly in terms of thinking about how people come to be conformists, um, how little control we have over our beliefs, um, uh, how sharing information online and in other kinds of contexts can go wrong. But those discussions are often fixated on how the belief polarization affects you inside your own head, as it were. What it does to your beliefs and attitudes and dispositions. It should be unsurprising, and when I say it, you should go, of course, the belief polarization phenomenon, as it, tr as it transforms you into a more extreme version of yourself by extremifying your beliefs and attitudes, it also transforms your beliefs and attitudes with respect to other people. Of course it does. Why wouldn't it? <clears throat> when belief polarization takes effect, as we shift, that is, as we shift into more extreme versions of ourselves, we become more prone to dismiss criticisms of our view. We become less prone to listen to people who we suspect are going to voice criticisms, even when we have reason to think they're not talking about that. We become more prone to interrupt them when they're speaking, even about mundane matters. We come to attribute to the opposing side only the most extreme version of the opposing side's positive view. That is, we, we come to lose the capacity to recognize nuance in the opposing side's positive proposals. Not only can't we hear the critical thoughts that they have about our position, we come to see them as extreme and monolithic. We come to see them as um, um, manifesting an, un, an implausible degree of unanimity. We come to see the other side as all agreed about the thing that uh, uh, we oppose them on. <clears throat> Moreover, as we believe polarize, we come to see more and more of our opposition's behavior as explicable by their political commitments. If this is puzzling to you, think for a moment of how much political critique is really just mocking the other side's consumption habits. If you're drinking a latte, you're wearing camouflage, you're wearing yoga pants. You vacation in foreign countries and have a passport, right? Um, so on and so forth, right? Um, so more and more of what constitutes political critique is just emphasizing the respect in which the political rival is, from the point of view of their entire social identity and lifestyle, other. And the fact that you're drinking the latte becomes an expression of your political affiliation, right? By the way, if you're I've got a discussion in the book of the, dis the difference between the inside of a Starbucks and the inside of a Dunkin' Donuts. You can tell a lot about who the clientele are. Starbucks skews liberal, Dunkin' Donuts skews conservative, by the way. Starbucks is a place to buy coffee for people who want the momentary illusion of being in a foreign country, who imagine themselves cosmopolitan. What is the long-standing now slogan for Dunkin' Donuts? Anybody know? America runs on Dunkin'. Dunkin' Donuts sells coffee for people who want carbohydrates and caffeine so they can get to work and be alert. And if you just look at the interior, if you look at the interior of the shop, you can you can see it, right? Okay, um, good. Um, as we believe polarized, then not only do we become less good at hearing the other side, do we become less able to. Uh, to formulate an accurate depiction of the other side's views, they start looking to us 
increasingly alien, irrational, inscrutable, and ultimately, uh, we come to be repulsed by them because they start looking like threats, because after all, they become to feel icky to us. Okay, so we can stick the two conceptions of polarization, the political and the belief uh, uh, phenomena, together in a certain way. That is, once we realize that our physical and social environments can induce belief polarization, we can see um, a problem uh, with uh, how polarization sort of, uh, the two polarizations fit together. Um, that is, they reinforce each other. I call it the polarization dynamic. So we've already seen that belief polarization uh, begets, maybe causes, <laughs> what we called earlier affective polarization. It's part of the profile of the cognitive phenomenon to cause in us increasingly negative attitudes towards people we perceive to be different. Once we see that, we see that affective polarization among rank and file citizens sends a clear strategic signal to party leaders, candidates, uh, and parties to, 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 to accentuate, to fixate on, and to exaggerate the differences between the parties. That is, belief polarization by way of affective polarization induces, through a very simple strategic calculation, the full profile, all three registers, of political polarization. <clears throat> and, because it's a dynamic, political polarization in fact separates us, in fact gives us more occasion to feel icky and alienated from the other side, which intensifies belief polarization because it creates a political condition under which the only people we can get along with, the only people we think we can understand, the only people who aren't icky to us are the people who more or less believe the things we believe. And all the while, I want to suggest, our democratic capacities erode. That dissolved there. Erode is fine. <clears throat> Now, here's how that works. Um, so we've seen that this is a self-perpetuating spiral. Our capacities dissolve. Um, in order to make sense of that last claim, that our democratic capacities start to dissolve, it's necessary just to say a couple of quick things as the sort of democratic the philosopher who does democratic theory uh, uh, about that. I'm going to move very quickly. Um, look. When we think about democracy, we are most often inclined to think about the institutional and procedural mechanisms and features of a democratic society. Constitutions, separations of powers, elections, campaigns, voting, fundraising, um, uh, uh, coalition building, these are all important, I would not deny, uh, essential features of a democratic society. It's, of course, hard to make sense of those institutional, procedural, uh, and other mechanisms of democracy in the absence of a conceptualization of democracy as a moral ideal. Um, what I want to suggest to you, oh, sorry. What I want to suggest to you is that democracy is ultimately the ideal of self-government among political equals who nonetheless disagree about politics, right? So self-government political equality, a missed disagreement. Uh, the disagreement part is really important. In fact, most of the procedural, constitutional, and institutional mechanisms of democracy that we're most familiar with are actually strategies and mechanisms for managing disagreement over the most important stuff, like justice. However, because democratic disagreements are always disagreements among equals, the institutional stuff, the procedural stuff, is just not enough to capture what a democracy is. You need another feature. The, 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 the moral responsibility of democratic citizenship that falls to us as citizens. That is to say that part of what makes democracy a democracy is a kind of civic ethos. 
It's the kind of ethos that enables us to recognize amidst all the political disagreement that within a broad spectrum of opinion at least, our political rivals are nonetheless our political equals. And what I mean by political equals then, when you recognize somebody as a political equal, you're not merely recognizing that they get an equal say. You must be recognizing that they're entitled to it. If we're not committed to that, I want to submit to you, we're not fully committed to democracy. Now think about that thought, because it is a puzzle. <coughs> democracy requires me to manifest, to internalize a set of attitudes that will require me to regard as my equals people who I also have to regard as politically mistaken and possibly mistaken in such a way that puts them on the side of injustice? The answer is yes, within a very wide spectrum of opinion. Maybe not all opinion. You can talk about what's on the periphery if you like. With a wide spectrum of opinion, there's a way of being wrong about politics and therefore on the side of injustice that's consistent with being entitled to having an equal say. We don't recognize that. We're not really Democrats, I want to argue. And in order to thrive as a self-governing community of equals who disagree, we have to internalize that attitude. The polarization dynamic, as I think should be obvious, erodes that. The polarization dynamic has as its central profile the erosion of the capacity to see political rivals as nonetheless entitled to an equal say. Why? Because the dynamic is the dynamic that encourages us to see those who we regard as politically our opponents as incompetent, untrustworthy, dangerous, alien, benighted, <coughs> and irrational. Okay, that's the sort of conceptual with a little bit of the sort of cognitive empirical stuff that um, builds the <coughs> argument. Here's the real problem and the real bad news. It's really, it just keeps getting worse, folks, sorry. <laughs> Think about the fact that the belief polarization phenomenon can be induced simply by campaign signs, charts on a, on a board, uh, a picture of a sea of red hats, um, features of our physical and social environment can induce it. Let's talk about political saturation. Here's a real troubling fact. As the country in the aggregate, this by the way, I'm talking a lot about the US. The US is where these data are especially pronounced. They're not unique to the US though. Unfortunately, they're becoming even more pronounced in the UK right now. Here's the fact. As our society, as our country as a whole, has become more diverse along all the promising metrics that we like to think about and talk about and celebrate, the local space you inhabit in your day-to-day -day life has become int more intensely politically homogeneous. The places you shop, the places you spend your free time, how much time you spend in a park, where you vacation, what you do on vacation, how you decorate your home and workspace are all tightly correlated with your political loyalties. If you feed your pet wet food, you are likely to be conservative. If you feed your pet dry food, you're likely to be liberal. If you own a current coffee maker, you're likely to be conservative. Again, these are all surprising. The number of clocks in your home positively correlates with, your, with how conservative you are. The number of clocks in your workspace does the same. The number of maps you have in your home correlates with, your, with how liberal you are. Now look, if you say these things individually, you can sort of think your way into explaining them. Okay, I got it, I think I got it. But note what's happening, right? We're recognizing that aspects of our lifestyle that arguably, I want to just suggest to you now, arguably, are non-political, are coded, tethered to, and expressive of 
our political allegiances. Do you want to see this? Think about the tote bags. Who knew that there was something important to think about tote bags? There is. The number of tote bags you have positively correlates with how liberal you are. More tote bags, more liberal. Right? How many of you have a tote bag that has a message on it? Does the message indicate what your politics are? It probably does. It says things about how important you find recycling. It says things about how you like nature. It says things about what foreign country you've been to, right? All things tightly correlated with your political profile, right? Whole Foods, what is, Whole Foods is my favorite example because as a philosopher, I say, that's analytic, or at least as close to an analytic statement as a client like me will get. That's a joke for Dave. Um, the Whole Foods tote bag says values matter. That's, that's just what the definition of a value is. Um, anyway, <laughs> MSNBC tote bags. Anybody know what the MSNBC tote bag says? Because it says two things. One side says, talk politics to me. What does the other side say? This is who we are. Now no, I want to say that's a particularly salient example of what these cues and signals are. They invite a kind of interaction based on some political value while at the same time diverting or, or, or disincentivizing another. Talk politics to me, but first, know who I am. Right? Good. Yoga pants and camo and all the rest are really interesting. Um, there's this co-partisanship is the, um, uh, the, the most reliable indicator of success in online dating. If you are an online dater, you want to maximize the number of, I've never been on one of these sites, I'm a married guy, and my wife is wonderful. <laughs> she puts up with a lot, as you can probably already discern. Uh, um, you know, if you want to maximize the number of expressions of interest in you, make sure that your profile has no partisan cue, which is really hard. And by the way, it's not even conscious, right? We find faces more attractive when we are presented with a picture that has a very subtle partisan cue. A, a picture of a face with an American flag vaguely in the background gets rated as more attractive among conservatives than that same face without the American flag. In a way that you can't, the, the, the person doesn't liminally get to, doesn't, is not able to formulate the thought, well, she's patriotic. That's not part of their own understanding of their rating, okay? So what it looks like now is, given this phenomenon of political sorting, given the fact that as our societies become more diverse, the local spaces have become more politically homogeneous, um, we are, as a people, as a citizenry, more and more frequently expressing and enacting our politics. We are more and more frequently acting in the office of citizenship under conditions that are not properly democratic because they are politically homogeneous. You've probably heard a version of this argument uh, as it applies to online spaces. The echo chamber, filter bubble, diversify your feed kind of arguments. Um, the problem of cocoons and silos, the information bubble, if you think that any of those arguments are at least minimally plausible, I think that they're more than minimally, minimally plausible, <clears throat> you have to recognize something. You have even more reason to be worried about your everyday surroundings because they are even more coded with calls, ways of extracting expressions of your political allegiances in a way that signals to others what they are so that you are interacted with in these spaces as an ally or, increasingly and frequently, an obstacle to be gotten over politically. So the general lesson is that our everyday surroundings can induce belief polarization, and our everyday surroundings are increasingly organized around and conditioned by our political profiles. Now note how bleak this is. One more bleak thing. 
This is not an account according to which some anti-democratic force has sort of slithered its way into the democratic sphere and is messing it up. The culprit is our attempt to do democracy well, right? It's in our attempt to be active participants, responsible and engaged citizens that heightens these phenomena. That's all really bleak. Democracy, as I say in the book, is subject to an autoimmune disorder. That's the overdoing. What can we do? On a familiar account of some of what I've been saying, the prescriptive <laughs> upshot is to diversify your informational intake. Spend time on the other side's news pages. Read the, read the Wall Street Journal if you're a liberal. Read the New York Times if you're a conservative, so on and so forth. Um, no, those uh, proposals to deal with the problem by way of diversifying informational intake, turns out that these are good strategies for preventing the polarization dynamic. They are not strategies for remedying it once it's taken hold. We know this in every other context. What it takes to prevent something from happening is different from what it takes to undo it once it's happened. The polarization dynamic has happened. We are in the midst of it. We are spiraling down, I would like to suggest to you. Diversifying your intake, there's lots of now empirical results, in fact, backfires. A lot of studies on social media about this. Once you are sufficiently belief polarized, mere exposure to, not even engagement with, exposure to even the most milk toasty, moderate expressions of the other side's view intensifies your commitment to yours. Now I can tell a story about why that's the case based on my conception that the phenomenon is driven by this corroboration social identity stuff. So now you're getting the flavor for why it can't be more democracy. It can't be more democracy because politics is the problem. The solution I want to suggest to you is desaturation. Find ways to desaturate the social environment <coughs> from explicit and implicit calls to your political identity and allegiance. Now, um, what that requires um, is, I think, three things. The first of which is to recognize your own vulnerability to these phenomena. By the way, we've got a lot of data that show that most Americans, when you lay out this kind of data, will say, oh yeah, that's going on. Yeah, I see all my conservative friends are polarized. Right? <laughs> it's hard to see in your own case. But, you know, let's be philosophers again for a second. You're not special. <laughs> at least not in this, look, at least not in this regard. You're special. At least not in this regard, right? <laughs> um, uh, you know, so recognizing your own vulnerability. I think the proposal is to find things to do with others that I call non I call so non-political cooperative endeavors. These are not endeavors in which you suppress your political differences. These are not, it's not the proposal to go invite your enemies to dinner and uh, play softball with them. I mean, you might do those things. Um, I think, you know, it's probably okay. It's probably risky too. Um, I mean, let's try to think of things we could do together in which we are cooperating. But politics is just not part of the de description of the activity. Sarah looks puzzled. <clears throat> we struggle with the idea of a non-political cooperative activity. I want to suggest to you that's a symptom. <laughs> that limitation on our social imagination is part of the dynamic. Now, if you want some help getting your head around the idea of a non-political cooperative endeavor, I think there's a question that we can ask ourselves. What's democracy for? <laughs> we are living, we are enacting democracy as if democracy is for more of it. The point of democracy is more. Now, there is a sense of that thought which I, I don't want to re reject, right? The point of democracy is continuing democracy, for sure. <clears throat> Imagine somebody who decides one day 
that she's going to take up the project of achieving optimal physical fitness. And imagine that she undertakes a real rigorous exercise program and keeps to it. And imagine that within a couple months' time, she achieves extraordinary results. We're not talking about a case in which she's overdone fitness in the sense that she's pulled a hamstring and now has hurt her body. Imagine somebody who's pursued physical fitness to the extent and in such a way and with such an intensity that she loses all of her friends, no longer has time to go on hikes, can no longer visit the museum or the opera or do any of the other things that she finds of value because the project of becoming fit has become such the focus, the singular focus of everything that she does, that every other good and interest and value in her life is crowded out, expelled. We would wonder, what is the point of that? Surely the point of fitness is not more workouts. Surely the point of fitness is being fit better enables you to pursue other things of value that might contribute to your fitness, but that's not the point of those other things. Being fit enables you to, be to go on rewarding hikes with friends. Going on hikes with friends might contribute to your fitness, but that's not what you're doing. That's not the description under which you can take yourself to be acting. I want to suggest to you democracy, no matter what we think, about democracy's value. I happen to be an intrinsicalist. I think democracy has intrinsic value. Not denying, not claiming that democracy is merely a tool that has only instrumental value when I say what I'm about to say. I want to say part of the profile of democracy's good is that it is good for other things. What other things? It is good for securing the social and political conditions that allow us to live lives of value together, pursuing collectively, collaboratively, other things. Sometimes, at least. When we overdo democracy, we lose sight of those other things. And we lose the capacity to engage in them. And when we overdo democracy, we dilute and dissolve the capacities that we need in order to do democracy well when we are properly engaged in a political project. So as paradoxical as it might sound, in order to do democracy well, sometimes, together, we need to do something else. That's the talk. Thank you. Well, there's plenty of time for questions. Um, uh, I know uh, some of you are going to be going home or to friends for Thanksgiving. And uh, Rob has a piece from a couple years ago called Must We Survive Thanksgiving? And it's just about those kinds of conversations that are difficult. And uh, um, so thoughts about uh, democracy, about surviving Thanksgiving, about uh, the sorts of saturation that you've noticed in, in among your friends or among your coworkers or in another area? Professor Tyson. Thank you, Professor Talese, for this talk. We're friends, that's why we're making fun of each other right now. Um, uh, it seems like, so you said this is not limited to the US, at least the other things, but it seems like the US has a particularly bad system because it's a two party system. Um, and it, so I was thinking about like what's been happening in Italy or what's been happening in Israel. Like people are exhausted and they're really tired of these, Israel in particular is a case where it's like they're really tired of doing democracy, but it seems like part of the reason they're so exhausted is because they don't have a strictly two-party system. So I'm just wondering, um, I'm wondering if you think, this is I guess an empirical question about the United States, if you think, is it something like the f sort of federal state split that could, might save us from what's happening right now? Because I'm worried about, I'm worried about views outside of an acceptable range becoming dominant right now, yeah. views that I would call fascist, mm -hmm. that it seems like the two-party system is particularly bad at having any response to? Right. Um, so just a couple of things about the data. OK. Um, so the, um, <coughs> the peculiarities of the United States system, two parties, first past the post, yeah. this particular way of understanding the separation of powers and the peculiarities of our Constitution, 
helps explain where these divisions show up, where the trends show up. In parliamentary systems, in other democracies, uh, in systems like certainly in the UK, um, and in other parts of Europe, you find similar trends with a similar degree of intensity. They just, they just turn up in different spots. Right? Yeah. They tend to be not so focused on which party is in control, but what the policies are, right? Or what the stance of the country is, or what the identity of the nation is supposed to be like. So, um, and by the way, in the French case, you can think of that last. <laughs> right, okay, good, good, good. So you find similar trends, maybe not quite as intense in <coughs> European democracies. So the constitutional design and the electoral design help to determine where you see this, not whether you see it. Or, um, but maybe you're right, in, 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 it seems to me that it's probably likely to be true that um, certain peculiarities of the American system help explain why you're seeing the intensity that you're seeing, where you're seeing it in the United States right now. But that is a real sophisticated empirical matter for social science that, um, you know, any simple answer about that, I think, would have to be kind of simplistic social science. So it's sort of hard to know exactly what to say. Um, uh, you know, in this country, the Pew Research Center has just, well, a couple months ago, discovered 60-something percent of America thinks that our politics is unacceptably hostile, unacceptably uncivil, unacceptably rancorous, deadlocked, polarized in that popular sense of the term, and they want an end to it. Good news, right? No. You ask them, <laughs> well, how did it get this way? And they said, it's the other party. They did it. And then you ask them the next question. Well, how do we build a more cooperative civil policy, politics? They said, tell the people on the other side to give us what we want. Which, by the way, is just an expression of the problem, but also exactly what the model should predict. Right? You can see, you see it, like, belief polarization is like your side view mirror, right? You see the other people moving, like, smaller and smaller and harder to make out, right? Harder to see. They seem distorted to you. So they're obviously the problem. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, yeah, right. So, um, I guess this is an empirical question. I'm not exactly sure, but um, I have this idea that philosophical discussion cultivated context for philosophical discussion actually works against belief polarization. But I don't know what the data is, uh, or what the data suggests about that. But, I mean, I'm familiar enough with the examples that you brought up, you know, sports teams, religion, political rallies. There, there are lots of contexts that seem designed to intensify Belief polarization, and yet I still I carry around this fantasy that through philosophy we actually help to uh, to work against that or free free up a situation where something other than that dynamic might you know uh, come about. I, I'm, I'm so, curious as to your thoughts on that. So I I share that I, I, I wouldn't call it a fantasy. I share that hope uh, that. Um, philosophy can make the world better, um, and maybe does. Um, now, the data here are really interesting. So let me just give one result that um, uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to report is not so robust that we just ought to accept it. But if it is robust, we've got, you and I both have problems. So whereas you might be, whereas it might be correct, according to this uh, uh, series of data, that um, not merely cross-cutting dialogue with the political other, right, tends to reverse this polarization trend. But a certain kind of interaction, right, that I think is properly characterized as philosophical. Looking at the arguments, look, you know, looking at um, uh, different kinds of sources of information, hearing narrative from people who have different stakes in the issue, all of this stuff looks to me like good philosophically organized conversation. Some of it's argumentative, not all of it is. Um, that does look like it's got all kinds of moderating uh, um, uh, ramifications for the people who participate. Here's the problem. 
it looks like we've got some reason to think that uh, when people are moderated in that way, they also become less likely to vote. <laughs> that properly structured political deliberation has a trade-off with political participation. You want people to be engaged, participants are gonna go out and vote, it's better that they be polarized. You want people to be more responsive to considerations, you want them to hear the other side, you want them to be more reflective citizens, that's positively correlated with not participating. Now, we might say, some people do say this kind of thing, well, maybe that just means that for democratic theory, we ought to think that participation doesn't really have to be so centered on voting. Does engaging in that kind of philosophical dialogue make people more likely to socially interact in other kinds of pro-democratic ways? De you know, democracy is not just voting, right? How much more likely are you to volunteer to teach people to read or to, you know? So, and there are some data that are like, it makes you less likely to vote but maybe it gives you more pro-social attitudes in other spheres. Um, but if this is, and the deliberative Democrats in the world who pay attention, sometimes they just try to ignore this result, but who pay attention to this result, they're just trying to figure out what's wrong with the methodology that gets you there. And maybe they're right that, you know, this is some a political scientist at Penn named Diana Mutz. Um, maybe she's, you know, the data don't show what she says they show, or maybe the data aren't collected in the right way. But if the result stands, and I think that at least it's not clear that it doesn't. We've got a whole other sort of um, cog uh, that we need to think about because we don't want merely depolarization. We do. We also want depolarization in a way that's consistent with uh, and compatible with uh, um, an a, a, a adequate level of political activity, political behavior. So I agree with you, but worry. <laughs> sure. I'm interested to hear more about desaturation and non-political collaborative actions. Also, thank you for your talk. Oh, sure. Um, so here's one way um, to think about what what I might be talking about, right? So you know, I give these talks and people. Well, let me just tell a very quick story, and then I'll tell you why I'm a little bit cagey about sort of saying what I'm talking. about. One of the very first times I gave a talk about this stuff was beginning to write the book. Um, some audience member said, um, Professor Talese, what should I do? Right, well, give me a practical suggestion. And you know, I just walked around with this, this by the way, story comes up in the book. Uh, I just walked around with this thought, I don't know, like, you know, volunteer to pick up litter from you know, the local park. How about that? Volunteer to teach somebody to read. How about that? And the person looked at me and said, those are liberal things to do. And I wasn't as attuned to some of this stuff as I am now, I like to think, and I totally missed the opportunity. I said, what, being against litter is liberal? Like, what, Republicans like litter? What are you talking? You know, I gave this sort of, you know, jerk philosopher, you know, kind of reply, like, what's wrong with you? Like, yeah, okay. Um, what I didn't do, what should have done, is just sort of interrogated it. Like, well, what do you mean it's a liberal thing to do? You think volunteering is liberal? Or is it volunteering outside your church? Or is it volunteering in a way that prioritizes something as trivial, given all the world's problems, as litter? You know what I mean? Like, I should have, again, gone back and just said, look, I want to understand what you think makes that a liberal thing, but didn't. And I, 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 I manifested the, um, the problem, as it were, I just like, wow, this is some crazy conservative person listening to this talk and thinks that, you know, being being against litter in the park is a Democrat, is something Hillary Clinton would do. You know what I mean? This kind of thing, right? Um, so, uh, I'm a little bit um, uh, wary of trying to give the direct answer because anything that I'm going to, and I say this in the book, anything that I could suggest is sort of like, try this, is likely to be because. I, like you and everybody, and part of the message of the book is recognize your vulnerability to these phenomena. It's like, yeah, my conception of what is likely to be a nonpartisan, nonpolitical cooperative activity is kind of likely to be just something I can't see as expressive of my political identity. So I better not get engaged in that, right? Ultimately, what I wind up saying in the book is think hard, recognize your vulnerability, 
And just think hard. What could one do? Doesn't have to be a big, you know, big, you know, social project for the greater good. What can one do that will put one in the presence of somebody, not necessarily somebody whose politics you hate, but somebody whose politics you don't know anything about? Engaged in something where politics is just as irrelevant to the activity as a discussion of the interior color of your car, right? Think about that. Could there be something like that? By the way, uh, the uh, Sarah who lived in Nashville for a little while, I started going to the um, to the station in to listen to the bluegrass jam, <laughs> right? Okay. Talking to people about mandolin players, I suspect a lot of them are not politically on my side. But you know what? They're reflective people about that about art, right? They think things. They think sophisticated thoughts. I'm a little bit less able now if I do find out their politics, to think of them as people with horns coming out of their heads. A little bit less able to do that. But let me just say one quick thing, and we'll get to the question in the back. Um, here's just the way the trends have worked. Um, sites in civil society where these kinds of interactions used to occur have all receded. Workplaces used to be sites where people of different political backgrounds interacted in a cooperative way, such that they came to see each other as reliable co-workers, you know, uh, good guys, responsible parents. Our, the American workplace is increasingly politically homogeneous, as are American professions, by the way. Your foot doctor is likely to be liberal. Your surgeon is likely to be conservative. Your dentist is likely to be liberal. I mean, you know, just, these are not just sort of like, like easily, so like, oh, it's got to, these are pretty systematic trends across the country, right? So professions, workspaces, and think about, um, and this is uh, uh, a site that is um, a lot of people, this, people in Nashville and other places uh, in the south of the country sort of start thinking, say, oh, right, I see that. Um, congregations, right? Uh, congregations used to be far more politically heterogeneous. Now they're almost... I mean, now, churches in the South, especially Protestant denominations in the South, are very keen to signal their politics. Now, one story about that, let me just say one thing, I'll get to the question now. One story about that, one intuitive story that, we, that, you're, that we're likely to find sort of, like, oh, I can explain that. As a sort of the result of the 60s and the 70s, come the 80s, the pastors find the cultural values shifting in line, with, in line with some of the social movements of the 60s, and they feel that the traditional Christian values are under attack, so they counterattack by introducing more political messaging into their worship service. It turns out that that might not be the right way that the causal arrow goes, or the explanatory arrow goes got all kinds of reasons to think, no, you want to know what happens in the 80s? People start showing up on Sunday and Wednesday night looking for a confirmation of their politics from their worship. Because we've got data now, there's a book about this by a, a political scientist named Michelle Margolis called from, Pol from the Politics to the Pews that shows that, yeah, the pastors who didn't make, overt, make overtly political, their Worship service, their 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 preaching, they lost their congregations. People showed up with an interest in and a demand for a unifying and homogenized confirmation of their political identity from all areas of life, including their religious observance. And that these are complex social phenomena. Surely this is not an either or. These are sort of arrows that go in all kinds of different directions. That's part of the causal story though, right? So um, we, uh, it was much more likely that um, neighborhoods, workplaces, places of worship, schools, were sites where there were these kinds of activities. And they've all receded, right? Why they received the complicated story? But I think that once you start thinking those thoughts, you say, okay, now I'm getting a picture, right? We're gathered, we're, we're gathered in this activity because we care about our kids' education. That's not a matter of Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, right? That's something, we're doing something else when we're at the PTA meeting, right? 
Um, and uh, we've lost that, it seems. So that's, just, that's not, I know it's not um, satisfying, because it's not like, here are things you need. Here's the, here are the, here's the to-do list. Um, but uh, that's as much of an answer I feel I'm entitled to give if I think that the story up to that point has been correct. Yes? My brain went to the same place, same kind of question, because as the director of student life, my office works with student government. We work with a community service program, and my brain went right to, oh, people should you know, volunteer together. And I just took students to the food bank a couple weeks ago. Amazing conversation with people during that time. Never touched politics, Good. right? But then I also had that, is that liberal? That I see hunger is something that should be addressed and that I can go and assist. Right. Um, so I'm curious, when you think about, you know, 18 to 22, 24 year olds is the average traditional age of college student, you know, staff like me on a college campus, we're trying to provide events and experiences where students can meet others and have that dialogue. What kind of suggestions do we have for us? Because your belief polarization stuff, I've seen that happen, and I'm like, how do we tackle that? Because this is supposed to be the space where we can't hear somebody else's opinion and go, Think that. I don't get that, but we've lost the ability to have that conversation, at least in what I'm observing, in that traditional age student. Yeah, no, that that seems right. You know, the kind of efforts you're uh, describing are all really positive. Let me just say, like, very quickly, like, I'm not opposed to any of the things that people are trying. <laughs> right. I'm all for that. And to, um, in case this part isn't clear, to suggest that politics, if we're going to do it, democratic politics, if we're going to do it correctly, has to have a place and can't be the all-consuming thing that we do, is certainly not to suggest that the place that poli democratic politics has is small or insignificant, right? It's like, when you're doing democratic politics, go all in, right? Do it. It just, that can't be the only thing that you do. But because of political saturation, it is, in order to do more of the other stuff, you have to de you depoliticize, desaturate something else, because that's where we're at culturally. So um, I'm all for these kinds of things. Now you're right though that you know to somebody who is um, invested in the idea that what goes on on college campuses is a kind of um, uh, recruiting for liberal politics they will see these kinds of initiatives as expressions of partisan identity. Again, I'm, I'm tempted to say the same thing I, did, I said to the person who's like, well, that's a liberal thing to do is to pick up litter. Um, one other story about, uh, about this that, again, it's, this one didn't make it into the book because I suspect I will run into this person again somewhere in my life. Um, so in Nashville, I, I, as, as Dave mentioned, um, uh, I gave this TED talk on this stuff um, uh, a little over a year ago, and um, some guy walked up to me afterwards, a very tall guy, cowboy hat. He said, well, professor, I just want you to know that I agree with everything you said up there. I said, oh, thanks. It's a surprise to me. I said, okay, why? He said, well, I thought we were gonna have to fight. <laughs> I said, you thought we were going to have to fight? He said, well, I looked you up online, and I saw that you were a professor. And then I saw that you're a philosophy professor, so I figured you'd be a Democrat. So here's a guy, right? Listen to 18 minutes of me speak, discovered that I didn't have horns coming out of my head, and inferred that I was in the same party as him. That looks like that looks to me like the symptom, right? That's the problem, right? That's the problem, um, and uh, you know it's a funny feature of some of the promising initiatives. You know, just to give one philosophical example of how some of the, how weird this can be. Um, you know, friends are important. It's really important to have friends. You need to in order to live a good life. You know, Aristotle got this part right. You need friends. Maybe Aristotle didn't get right that you need only a certain number. Uh, you know, he's got that discussion. How many friends is too many? Um, so friendship is really, really important. You know, to living a good life, and it's good to have friends. Um, but we all know, right? One of the ways to fail at making friends is to 
allow the project of friendship making to be the center of your social interactions, right? When you get together with people for the purpose, when you see the purpose of the interaction to be a friend-making interaction, you look weird to people, right? You try too hard, you creep them out, right? So it's almost like you can't make friends by engaging in activity that is described as friendship-making, right? You make friends as a, as a byproduct of other kinds of social interactions. Similarly, I worry, I don't know what goes on in your office, but I worry that um, colleges, some, some of the stuff that goes on at Vanderbilt uh, is like this, where part of the description is social responsibility. We do teach that in our leadership program. Okay, we, so I, and I'm not opposed to that. I just right, yeah, worry. But you're right, that is part of the college leadership trend across the country. Good, yeah. right. And I just worry that that's like me saying to Sarah tomorrow morning when we meet for coffee, We've been friends for a long time. I think we should, you know, do something to enrich our friendship. And Sarah says, sure, Rob, that'd be great. What do you say we should do? And I say, duh, enrich our friendship. <laughs> right? By the way, if you are laughing at that, you're almost a philosopher. Well, you are at least a philosopher. <laughs> That's a joke that, you know, I tell and people are like, huh? Like, well, it's a philosopher's joke. Um, so I worry that that framing, that description, the description under which the activity is taken, can be a kind of banana peel that it slips, that you know, that it falls, it slip, that it trips itself on, because you say, well, this is the part now where I'm sort of learning leadership and volunteerism and social responsibility. Those are all look like they're politically intoned things, whereas I want to suggest part of what we have to do to save democracy is engage in certain kinds of activities that have as an effect, right, deepening our democratic capacities but they yet cannot have that as their express objective. Right. Kind of like the friendship case. I heard about research like in the early 90s, and I don't even know if this is legit, but it was about how women tend to develop friendships and men tend to develop buddyship. And when I think of today's students, almost 30 years later with the internet and social media and less time spent face to face, it makes me wonder when people do come together, <coughs> it's about buddyship, yeah. we've yeah. lost the ability to have friendships where somebody may have a different philosophy about something, but because you're friends, you respect and you can agree to disagree or right. just value you think differently than I do. Cool. Yeah, so in the, in the book, I, I actually um, attach to the idea that there is this ethics of citizenship, this ethos that we have to try to manifest in ourselves um, if we're going to do democracy well. Uh, I characterize that and give a description of it, but it's, it, it, you know, I say, look, I can't get too particular because we disagree about you know, the particulars of the ethics, and it's part of democracy to try to negotiate and work through these disagreements. But I do call it civic friendship. So what democracy requires is not that we're friends, but that we have a closely related set of attitudes. What um, uh, Rousseau, uh, you know, a certain register, and uh, other political philosophers like John Rawls called civic friendship. We find which I just mean. That set of capacities, which we can go on and try to figure out what they are, that will enable me to recognize you as entitled to an equal say, despite the fact that I think you've got totally messed up views about politics, about justice, about freedom and equality and autonomy and dignity, that nonetheless, you're still my equal and if the right processes are followed, the right procedures are followed, and you get your way, that doesn't mean I have to resign, but it does mean that that's a legitimate outcome. <laughs> that's, that's not a reason to give up on democracy. It's a reason to keep fighting for what I think justice requires through democratic channels. It's not a reason, though, to condemn the democracy to something anti-democratic because I didn't get my way about this important thing. That's a really difficult attitude to sustain. When you think, if you think of democracy, it's really not intuitively plausible, even, when you think about it. Like, well, democracy requires me to recognize that an outcome. Have you connected emotional intelligence research well, with that so thought? Well, so there is some promising thoughts there about sympathy and empathy and all that, um, and how to try to build that. But just to think about it, democracy requires that I recognize that there are some people around me who not only have wrong, incorrect views about justice, 
but have views about justice that are provably, from my point of view, wrong, bad, ill-considered, irrational, right? Not only that, I think that they're right. Like, I can show that certain versions of libertarianism, this is my own case, or just, or I can show, I think I can show that they're wrong, right? It's like, yeah, but if the process is followed, that's the legitimate result, and that's what the government is required to enact. So how in the world could that possibly be? A, it looks like it's a um, intrinsically irrational attitude. You're wrong about the most important things, but you're entitled to an equal say, and if enough people agree with you, you get to call the shots. Not in this way that I have to resign, but you get a legitimate outcome. Now, what I say in the book is, yeah, that looks like it's just sort of like, how can anybody sustain that? I say, well, just think about the attitude of religious toleration, which I think is the analogous attitude. Salvation is the most important thing that a human life can achieve. It's my duty as a you know, religiously convicted individual to try to help other people live lives that helps achieve their, their, uh, their salvation. However, freedom of conscience trumps that somehow. But you just said it was the most important thing, right? See, well, religious toleration looks like it's got that people are allowed to live in theological error and peril. No, that looks like it's inconsistent with your conception of your religious conviction. But nonetheless, those attitudes are, have won the day. Right? I say, yeah, democratic citizens need a reformation. The, I'm sorry, yeah. Um, so I really enjoyed your speech, um, especially uh, where you left off on non-political cooperative endeavors. Um, I wanted to see what your thoughts um, they are on habeas corpus, especially over the last plus years the expansion of the federal level has taken place, kind of went on kind of the state level uh, removal of discretion over sentencing. Um, as a solution, can't we all agree? Um, and I, I think we do, um, you know, for humanity, you know, each individual to the idea of completing a fair trial and how um, these things that have been implemented over the years have um, given rise to pronounced especially places like California give rise to the trial conviction. Yeah, so um, uh, I'm on your side about all that. <laughs> um, the, um, here's what I, 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 I want to say. Here's my stock answer to this, this kind of question. When we look at a disturbing policy trend or trend within expansion of powers of government, lack of accountability, the way in which our representatives have become less and less representative uh, of their constituents. Um, we look at those and say, look, well, what do you say about that? And I said, look, I think my account gives, a, gives one part of the explanation of how we got here, right? Because I think, and this is, I don't, I know this is the end of our time, so I'm just gonna say something that would have to be defended, but just, you know, we can talk later. Um, because I think that um, when we overdo democracy, not only do we act less well as democratic citizens, not only do we erode our capacities to act well as democratic citizens, I think that we contribute to the production of democratic outcomes, or political outcomes, that um, run counter to our political objectives. I think we become less good, not only less good at pursuing justice, I think we also contribute to the further codification of the unjust status quo. <coughs> That is its, the further codification of the unjust status quo is itself injustice, right? So I think that we contribute to the injustice, of, we wind up contributing to the further vulnerability of the people on whose behalf our political projects are supposed to be working when we overdo it. So I, I think that, having defended that, I think I can, and I think that this account gives it a, a reason why some of the shifts in the mechanism of government that we've seen in the last, you know, since the 80s, have occurred, right? Okay. Have occurred. Great. Yeah. All right. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, thank Rob. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please, there's, lot, yeah, there's lots share. of food that yes. that we'd love you to eat. Please take, take whatever you want. Um, tomorrow afternoon, 3:30, the same location that will just be in this one section. We're having an open mic.